You guys can have a seat. Man, I, I just don't know. Like, I've got a lot to offer. I work super hard. I'm consistent. I like do the same thing every day. Come in, work. I don't know, maybe I was just working too loud or too hard. I'm just doing the job. I do it good. You know, it's just dumb. This is like my fifth job since like July. I just don't know what the problem is, man. I don't know what the big deal is. Is it cold in here? Elephant in the room. Hopefully there's no one like that elephant in this room right now. It would be, it'd be very cold. You'd be getting cold icy stairs as well. No, I'm just kidding. We're at Whitewater. We would just accept you as is. Hey, uh, so good to see you. My name is George, one of the pastors here. Uh, I'm so, so, so excited to be here. We're in this series called Elephant in the room. An elephant is that thing that people, everyone in the family, everyone in your office, everyone in your life maybe, but you, are acutely aware of, but no one wants to talk about. You know what I'm talking about? You guys, you guys understand uh, what I'm saying here? Uh, elephant in the room. We've got a, a picture. Uh, I think this accurately represents. They've got this beautiful living room and there's all these people looking into this living room that's, it's really a museum art show. And there's this elephant there. It's a pretty pink elephant. And uh, when, when I was looking at this, um, I just thought it, it was pretty ridiculous. Michael showed me, I was like, that's a ridiculous thing. But when you think about our lives and how ridiculous that is, we can become ridiculous people, can't we? When we have this big thing in our life that we're not willing to talk about. We're not willing to deal with. We don't even want to move it. We just keep feeding the elephant. We keep feeding the elephant. Last week, we really tackled that. We talked about this idea that, that to get rid of an elephant, um, you have to do a few things. You have to reveal it. You have to see it. You have to see that there's actually an elephant. It doesn't just blend in. You become aware. So you reveal the elephant. That takes courage. It takes humility. And then the big courageous part is next where you decide to reject the elephant. So you reveal, you reject the elephant. Um, but you can't just stop at, at just rejecting it and getting the elephant out. Um, you actually have to replace the elephant because we learned last week that you can get the elephant out for a little while and you can clean your house up. And, you know, we all have these rooms in our hearts. We have these rooms in our lives that we can, we can get fixed for a little while. We can get rid of the addiction. We can hide it. Uh, we can be like that alcoholic that, uh, that whose family hides them in the closet when other people come around or church people come around because we want to hide it. We can be that, that person that has that, that anger issue or that thing or that, that area of our life that no one else can touch. You know, like work is, is the most important thing or whatever it is. And we can clean the house, but if we don't replace it with the things of God, if we don't let Jesus come into our hearts or into that particular room, the elephant's going to come back. And it's going to come back with friends. I was talking with a guy re uh, recently, this last week, who decided to deal with an elephant in his life. And he's like, I have done exactly what you're talking about. Cleaned the house. I got rid of it. Got rid of all the evidence of the elephant. I did some shoveling to get that stuff out of there and make sure there's no evidence that an elephant was ever there. And then I thought I was doing fine. I thought it would be okay. And then the voices started, you know, telling me, man, you, you're never going to, you're not going to be able be able to, to kick this. You've never been able to stop. You've never been able to deal with this. And it, more pressure, more pressure, and all of a sudden the elephant came back and came back with friends. There were other things that started to erode, other things that started to just rot in his heart. And I, I wanted to ask a quick question. If you were here last week, how many of you guys started to recognize and reveal the elephant? How many of you guys started to deal with the elephant? I got some calls this week. I got some texts. I got some Facebook messages of people dealing with the elephant. I'm so, so excited about that. Because when we can get it out, we, that means we can change. We don't have to just remain in the same place. And that's something that really excites me. One of the things I want to take a quick break before we jump into the sermon, but one of the elephants we've noticed in the room of Pierce, of Pierce County is that there's probably like, it could be something like 7% to 12% of the population know Jesus. 
That means that, you know, 90%, somewhere around there, don't know Christ. And that's a big elephant. We wanted to do something about that. So what we are all about here, one of the big visions here uh, at Whitewater, is that we make disciples. We do that by creating environments of grace and belonging and love where, where we can trust ourselves with other people, which is sometimes hard. And then we can trust ourselves with God, and people can belong and experience God. They can experience his community even before they believe. That means that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to, like, clean up before you come into this building. Like, you can come as you are, like I said, even if you've got, you know, your boxers on. And that's it. You know, um, we'll have some conversations, but we'll love you. But we want to make disciples. We want to make leaders, and we want to plant churches so that we change that statistic. We think the elephant in the room is that there's not enough people who know Jesus. There's not enough people who are eternally connected to the living God. And today is a big day. A big day. And I don't know if you guys know about this, um, but you should. And I want to celebrate it. Um, we sent a group of people um, into the south end of Tacoma. Uh, their leader is John Kelly. He's like one of my best friends. He helped establish Whitewater, was a big leader here. And we sent him with some great leaders to launch a church in the south end and today is their launch day can we give that a hand everybody i stopped by um brought you know i brought donuts because they're they're from happy donuts downtown Puyallup, and they make people happy so i brought those and dropped them off really quick and just got to pray with john got to just see what they're doing and you guys we are part of a movement i want you to know that we are part of a movement that god is doing he is making disciples through us he is changing people's lives. There are people who don't know Christ yet in the South End, but because of your faith, because of the faith of that group out there, we're going to see more people find Jesus. We're going to continue to see that here in the Puyallup and greater Puyallup Valley because of faith and taking risk and getting that elephant out of the room. Amen? So uh, I wanted to celebrate that with you guys. That is a huge, huge win. Um, and I'm just going to pray for uh, Freedom Hill. They're actually like midway through their service right now. So I'm going to pray that it's gone well and that it's going to continue to go even better. Sound good? If you would pray with me. Father God, we, we're so thankful that um, you're not just uh, located in, in one uh, geography, Lord, one area. Lord, you are everywhere. You're so big. You're so man massive. You're immense. And you've created all things. And Lord, you are doing a work in our hearts and our lives with people who have walked in here maybe for the first time, second time, third time. Maybe they've been coming here for a while, Lord, but you want to do a work in our life. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we want to lift up our friends, our brothers and sisters at Freedom Hill. They're part of Flood the Sound Network. And we just pray that you would just begin flooding the sound in that area. Would your Holy Spirit convict people's hearts? Would you help people stick and decide to, to put their stake in the ground and say, I'm going to be a part of this church. Even if they don't know you yet, Lord, there's just something irresistible there. And Lord, may that be true here. May that be true at Bethany. May that be true um, in your churches in this whole area, God. We want to see the elephant in the room get kicked out. We want to see that low percentage of people who know Christ grow. And we, we submit that to you and we ask in great faith, Father God, that you would change that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's jump into, uh, into this sermon, into this talk. I've been really excited about this. Um, it's going to be talking about some stuff that I, I think can really change things. We're going to be going through rooms of the heart, rooms of the life, of our lives, um, and looking at different elephants that can be there. And today we're going to be talking about the elephant in the kitchen. The elephant in the kitchen. How many of you guys have a dining room in your house? Your rental or wherever you live? Okay, a few of you guys. How many of you guys actually eat there on a consistent basis? Oh, wow, you guys are amazing. Like, I lived in, we rarely ate in the actual dining room. We would eat in, like, the kitchen dining room. You know what I'm, t you know what I'm talking about? Maybe some of you guys are like, we don't have any of that. We just eat, like, on our couch, you know, with our TV. And that's where you eat. But a lot of times in American culture, the dining room has become kind of a place where you store things. Or it becomes like at the museum, you can't go there because it's supposed to be kept nice for some kind of guests that you're going to have someday in the future that never end up coming because you don't invite them. Because you don't want to have to clean anything in that room, right? Or it becomes like the entertainment. I've got some friends, they have like a TV and they've just like, they're just like, okay, it's just going to be our, our entertainment room. So they send the kids back there. But it's not the, it's not the place of eating and talking and hanging out. And in America, there's a, I feel like, one of the elephants in our lives, in the, in, in the room, and specifically in the kitchen, 
is disconnection. Like, see, the kitchen, when there's really good food cooking, and the kids are upstairs, and they smell the bacon, they smell the, bake, the baking of chocolate chip cookies without gluten or whatever you do, what do they do? What does your, what does your husband, what does your wife do when they smell good cooking? They come, they come down, like, what's going on? This is some home cooking. I want some good food. And, and all of a sudden, they're gathered. And all of a sudden, you're gathered, you start talking. And you start talking about real life. But in our culture, what often happens is we have, like, this TV meal culture where, where we'll just, like, heat up something real quick. We'll go, we'll go do our thing. And most families don't get any time together. Most people don't get time together because we're always in a rush or we're, like, super tired and we want to p- unplug and disconnect. And don't get me wrong, sometimes you need to rest. You like, sometimes my mind just needs to like, just chill for a little while and kind of slow some of those, you know, those rotations going on there. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, slow down, whoa, 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 you know. And you kind of just need to mellow. But it can be the worst thing, worst kind of poison in your family's life and your friend's life and in the lives of people who don't yet know Christ if we unplug at the expense of true connection and true love. You guys with me? Let me read you a stat that I found... uh, frighteningly fascinating. Uh, it says, uh, uh, this stat is, um, this was kind of a study that was done in Michigan about six years ago, and I'm guessing that it's actually gotten worse, but it says the average married couple spend 26 minutes or less a week connecting, like eye-to-eye connection, not like, hey, you need to go to the store, you need to go do this, and hey, I'm going to pick up the kids, and like that kind of like directional stuff. No, no, no. Like, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? 26 minutes on average. We don't know each other. We're not spending time together that matters. We might be active, busy, active, busy. But like those moments where we need to connect, we're disconnected. We're on like our phones. We're, you know, like... We're, we're watching TV, we're eating a TV quick meal. Our kids are there, we're there, but no one is there. Let me read you another statistic. Um, children, um, on average, watch three to five hours of television after school. So they're watching three to five hours. That's on average. That means like there are people that are like way more. There are kids that are watching way more and where parents are abdicating parenting and direction and connection to the TV. That's going to be another (laughs) talk that we have. But you guys with me? We are disconnected. We don't know each other. And we can have this TV dinner mentality. We can let the elephant remain in the room, be disconnected, pretend like it's not there. Or we can move into a place where all of a sudden there's aroma of chocolate chip cookies and real food, and it's healthy, and we can talk and be real, and all of a sudden laughter starts happening, storytelling starts happening, connection like, hey, I love you, I care about you, starts happening, and then lives start changing when that happens. It goes from disconnection to connection, and we have to create space for it. We gotta get the elephant out of the room, disconnection. That culture needs to go. So, There's this ancient art of hospitality, this ancient art of, like, having food, spreading it out amongst yourselves, eating it, loud chomping, and the food kind of coming out of your mouth, and people chortling and laughing and snorting and and, and just delighting in the food and maybe a beverage that's really tasty or whatever you guys have. And this ancient art of hospitality starts to happen. And it's this art that can be learned by anyone. It's not like high art, you know. It's not like Michael playing the guitar and I, like it would, I could never get that good. But at hospitality, I could be as good as Michael. I might even be able to get better. Because hospitality is about the heart. It's this ancient art of the heart, man. It's awesome. And I want to tell you guys that if we can get this as a church... We can kick the elephant out of the room. If we get this as a people, you guys can kick this out of, the, your, out of your home. And I'm, I'm telling you, one meal, one meal can change a life. Are you serious, George? One meal can really change something? Yeah, one meal. I'm going to show you how. We're going to look in a passage I think is 
It's one of my favorite passages. It's beautiful. It's in John it's chapter 21, and we're going to read through this story, and I need to set it up a little bit so, you, so we know where we're, we're at in the larger story. So Jesus has been crucified. When Jesus was crucified, all his disciples fled and left him. And then Jesus didn't remain dead because his father is the creator of the world and is pretty powerful, raised him back to life. And his disciples have, have kind of gone their own way. They've become disconnected. And they're fishing. Their, their trade were, was, they were fishermen. So they were pretty gnarly. Maybe they had wooden teeth. You know, maybe they had a few missing eyes. I don't know. But they were pretty gnarly type of people. And um, they, uh, they were fishing. And Jesus was gone. And their dream, the vision of this life of Christ that he created where he healed people and he forgave people. He gave people hope and he shut down the mean religious people and gave those who had nothing. He raised them up and made them something. And all that vision, all that dream has been shattered. And uh, they're fishing one night. They fish all night and they catch nothing. It's kind of like how the, the last three or four days have gone for them. It's like there's nothing. No, we can't do anything right. We're like We go back to our old profession. Their, their newer profession that they'd had for a while with Jesus was being fishers of men. So like we failed that. Let's go back to fishing for fish. And they fail at that at night. And they're like, are you kidding me? And in the morning when the dawn breaks, they see this figure on the banks, on the beach. And they see him motioning in. And all of a sudden they realize it's Jesus. And Peter, who's crazy, and he's, he's failed Jesus more than anybody, he, like, puts, they don't have their clothes on, they just have, like, like Derek, they just have, like, their skivvies. Is that what you guys call them, skivvies? That's the technical term. And he's got those on, and, they, like, he puts his robe on and then jumps in the water. That's, like, how, like, he was just, like, insane, like, when he saw Jesus. Jumps in the water, and they all start heading toward him. And, oh, in this, in this time, Jesus says, hey, throw your, your nets on the other side of the boat, and they've been fishing, they're like, we're fishermen, we haven't caught anything, they do it, and they get so many, so many fish, that they can't pull it in, and they realize it's him, and so they start coming into the bank, that's where we pick up this story, you guys with me? It says this in, um, we're going to be picking up in chapter 21, and we're going to be picking up in verse 9, so when they, they start heading toward the, toward the beach, and when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, awesome, Jesus made breakfast. You know that's got to be really good. Just saying. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. You know John, the guy who wrote this, was a food guy? Because he, like, describes it. And he's like, there's charcoal fire. We all know that the best barbecue is over charcoal, right? It just has that taste and that flavor. And um, there's some bread. And Jesus says this, bring some of the fish you've just caught. And Jesus, Jesus said to, uh, to them, and so Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore, and there were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. It's like this amazing thing that Jesus had done. Now come and have some uh, breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. And this was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. So this like amazing moment. And I, in this moment, there's this, this fish cooking, the smell of barbecue, and this wonderful moment. It's so simple, though. Like, Jesus breaks out the art of hospitality to welcome his disciples back into the fold. You guys, like, what's your, just really quick, we can't talk about food without talking about favorite food. What's your favorite food? My, what's that? Spaghetti har- carbonara. That's, I'd say that's like a 9 out of 10. That's, a, like, a, that's awesome. Yeah, right here. Bacon, that's okay. No, I'm just that's really, people are like, no, I'm leaving. You know, bacon's like nine and a half. What's that? Caramel apple? No, that's not, that's dessert. No, I'm just kidding. That's good food. That's good food. What, what else do you guys like? I like, um, I like seafood Alfredo, like real Alfredo sauce. Not the canned stuff, but the real, like made from scratch. It's my favorite. It's just like the cheese is so rich and it's good. I'm sorry. Sushi? Okay, that's like a two. <laughs> I got, like, all, our whole band loves sushi, and, like, they take me out once in a while. I'm learning to love it. I'm learning to love sushi. Um, how many of you guys like sushi? Is there a lot of sushi lovers? Okay, I better start loving it more. It's going to be a rampage. What else? What? Steak, baby. Well, that's steak, right? Not, okay. Good, steak. No cannibals here. Um, steak. 
chicken soup when you're, oh man, I was, I was sick uh, not too long ago, and I had some good pho chicken soup. It was so good and so tasty. Food, man, like, I don't know, we're just built for it. The smell of it, like, you know when you smell really good food, like it's, you know, the, the, the smell just comes wafting in, and there's this aroma, and you're like, oh man, that's amazing. There's something about the way we're wired that, like, taste and smell, it brings back memories. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it, like, reaches past the span of time and brings you right into that moment, you know, um, where, where you're, you're talking with that person or that thing happened or you're at that Super Bowl and everyone's going crazy and, or, you know, they're crazy because the Steelers stole a Super Bowl from us. You know, you remember those moments and take you back. I, I remember recently my, my grandpa was staying with us. My grandma died um, probably about nine months ago now. And he was staying with us as his first trip, first time ever being away from my grandma for like the last 60 years. And my wife is so sweet. She said, hey, um, George, his name, I'm the third, so he's George Sr. And uh, she said, what, what, what could I make you? What is your favorite food? Because my grandma's an ama- amazing cook, and she's gone, and he's, he's a terrible cook. And, uh, it's, you know, it's showing, you know, he's getting a little haggard, and she's like, what can I make you? And, and he, he says this, it was uh, chicken parmesan. We, like, flatten it. You like flatten it really good, and you kind of fry it. It's got this Parmesan, t- you know, special sauce that's kind of put on it, and it's fried. And my grandma was like a southern cook, um, and she, she loved fried food. And, and, and so we made that for him. I remember pounding this chicken down and getting it thin and, you know, basting it, doing all those things. And, and then we put it in front of him, and I remember putting the plate there. And here, Grandpa, and we were all going to eat, and we were about to, you know, hold hands. And he just went like this. He went... And just kind of looked up, and I, his eyes were, he was looking at me, but he wasn't with me. He was, in that moment, he was back, and he was remembering moments that only he can remember with my grandma. It was a special thing. And the art of hospitality is so much more than a meal, isn't it? And when the disciples smelled the food cooking, they smelled the bread, <coughs> They must have gone, their minds must remember each and every special moment to them. Maybe they had different moments. Maybe one of them was like, remember that one time we were just, it was the first time I started following him and Jesus cooked and I hadn't had a good meal in like days and it was amazing. I just was like, I'm going to follow you just because you're a great cook, Jesus. (laughs) Maybe, maybe one of them or or two of them remembered the feeding of the, of the 5,000. More than that because they're women and children and how Jesus took the bread and blessed the bread and broke the bread and then gave the bread and and they must remember that and remember the fish and the bread that he gave and these these memories memories just start washing over them can you see this do you guys feel it it's just this is real i mean jesus is real i mean he's he's resurrected but he's not this spiritual little ethereal ghost being he's resurrected new body can taste things better than we can taste can cook better than we can cook like he's real and and these memories start flowing back and then you know all of them when he started handing out all the good smelling aroma food that he had cooked and barbecued for them the fishermen love fish gives them fish and gives them bread and then they probably had some wine and jesus is handing it out what does that remind them of it was the night where he broke the bread and the wine and said whenever you do this Remember me. Let the memories flood back of when I was part of your life and this happened and this was real. Don't forget it. Remember that God is real in your life. Remember that I'm, I'm going to be present when you do this. There's something about it that's so special. And then you know there's this happiness and joy then mingled with guilt and shame. It was when Jesus needed the most when he was being taken to the cross and he was being humiliated and killed, murdered on behalf of their sins and our sins and the sins of the world and just put up to be mocked, where were they? Where were they who were his best friends? Where were they who were his disciples, his followers, the ones who were supposed to lead the way and lead the masses and minister to people and be there with and for? And Jesus, they had abandoned him. They ran They were cowards. And so you know when they're eating this food and there's this great joy, our our king, our master, Jesus is back. There's also this, oh, we failed. We've been disconnected. The elephant in the room, 
is that they weren't there for Jesus when he needed them. They were disconnected. They're not connected now. And, but Jesus, in the art of hospitality, when he's offering this food, you all of a sudden realize that the food is more than just food. It's these memories, but it's also leading a, in a vision toward the future that's, that, that says something. It says, you're forgiven. You abandoned me when I needed you most, but I can still eat with you, and I will cook for you, and I will serve you, and I'll bring you close, and we can become friends. And if there's any disconnect, if there's any um, area of your life where you feel like you can't be connected to me, and our relationship is broken, it's not because of me. It's because of you, because of the shame. But you're forgiven. We can be friends. Isn't that beautiful? This is the art of hospitality. This is what Jesus is doing in this moment. And after breakfast, breakfast, and Jesus asked Simon, there's this memorable meal that he makes and, and opens the way for conversation. He hasn't really said anything except, hey, eat, hang, just chill, relationship, action. But then Jesus wants to take some time, and I love how Jesus, he's very particular with his words. He's very sparse with his words. He doesn't have to say a lot, but he says a lot. Do you know what I mean? Listen to this. He says, Simon, son of John, he's talking to Peter, the leader, the ringleader, the guy who walked on water. The guy who said, I'll never deny you, Jesus. And all of a sudden, he, he says to, to, to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these gathered here? He reveals the elephant in the room. Do you love me? And Peter, fill, filled with regret and shame, at being disconnected and failing and, and being part of a, what he probably feels is a betrayal of his Lord and Savior. The night of Jesus' betrayal, when he needed him, he was gone. Jesus reveals the elephant in the room. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. And Peter's representing all the disciples. None of the other ones are exempt. Jesus is just talking to the leader and so he talks to the other disciples. And so Jesus' voice echoes through our, our age and our lives. He's not just talking to Peter. He's talking to all who would follow Jesus. All whose story is bent and fractured with moments of failure and betrayal and moments of unbelief and doubt and all that stuff. His, his voice echoes and pierces through all that stuff and says, Do you love me? Do you think he had the disciples' attention? Do you think they were listening? Do you think they were just chomping and not paying attention? It was like you, you, you could cut the tension with the knife. Do you love me? He asked a second time. And, and he says, feed my lambs, Jesus told him. And Jesus said, repeated the question, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter said, you know, I love you. It's getting more painful. And take care of my sheep, Jesus said. And a third time he asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? love me and the third time's the charm the third time's where the knife comes in but it's not a knife that's just trying to pierce and hurt it's a knife that's trying to cut out the elephant it's, a, it's trying to cut out the poison and what's happening here is who denied jesus three times peter did lord i'll never he said i'll never leave you i'll never i would never be all these guys will leave but i'll stay here i've got the guts i've got the courage i've got the faith and then when he was put to test, he, he cursed and denied even knowing Jesus three times. Hey, aren't you the person who follows? No, 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 that's not me. No, 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 you look like one of those guys from the north. You follow Jesus. No, I don't know him. And then someone else, you know, in the courtyard as, as Peter's hiding there, you know, that says, no, you're part of that. And he's like, I swear. And he starts swearing that he doesn't know Jesus and swearing at Jesus totally blows it. And this third time... Jesus asked him, do you love me? And Peter, it says, was hurt. Have you ever had that moment of faith, that moment with someone where they asked that thing, they put their finger right on the part of your heart that's just so painful and it hurts so bad. And you know they love you and they know they're not, they're just not just wanting to rub your nose in it, but they have to get to the pain so that you can get to healing and so you can change. Do you love me? And he hurt. He was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you, you know everything. 
and you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then, sh- then feed my sheep. The first time Jesus asked it, he reveals the elephant. The second time Jesus asked, do you love me? He helps Peter reject the elephant. Yeah, Lord, I love you. I'm all about you. It's not about the path. The third time, he's replacing the elephant. Your love, our connection is real. Right now, you are forgiven. And Jesus repairs the elephant when he rejects and replaces it. The disconnection is gone in a meal, in a moment, eating food, and it gets real. Face to face. And Peter listens, and Jesus speaks. And then Peter speaks, and Jesus listens. And then Jesus speaks. Do you see how there's this flow? Sometimes there's people that kind of get in this flow that it's like, I speak, and you listen. And then I speak, and you listen. And then uh, I speak, and then... And there's, and there's no two-way street going on. There's no... It's, you're just talking at someone, not talking with someone. I love that Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, who created all things, is having a conversation with flow, where it goes back and forth. And Jesus is making a point, and he's bringing this guy in, and he's repairing a relationship, and he's restoring a leader, and he's raising him back from the dead. Like, this guy probably thought he was done. He's not going to lead anything. And Jesus says, I want you. I love you. Do you love me? Do you know that our relationship is, is restored because of what I did on the cross and because of my great love for you? I want you to know at every table, in every home, every business, in every school, there are families, there are couples, there are kids, there are friends, there are strangers sitting at the table wondering the answer to that question, do you love me? Do you know that? When we sit with our kids, and if we take time with them, we'll hear it. If we don't take time, we're not going to hear it from the stranger, we're not going to hear it from our kids, we're not going to hear it from our spouse, we're not going to hear that behind all the noise or the thing you're talking about, the food that's being consumed, whether it's awesome or mediocre, that behind all that, there's a question that every human is asking, do you love me? Are we connected or are we disconnected? And one of the most basic functions of the art of hospitality that's ancient, that goes back to the beginning of time, to the time of Christ, where he was with his disciples. I mean, you could think of all sorts of things that Jesus could do, but he makes a little barbecue meal, and they talk. Do you love me? That's the question that's being asked every day, all the time. And that means that there's there's a starved soul longing for connection in an obese world of disconnection. There are starved souls all around us longing for love in a world that is a glut and obese with hatred and apathy. Do we hear people when they're saying, underneath the noise, do you love me? Do we give our kids the relational love and environment of grace so that we can, they can be heard and the answer can come resoundingly from your heart, from your mouth, from your actions to them that says yes every time. I love you. In this moment, yeah, I, you know, in the, the, there's all these questions Jesus could have asked. He could have could have asked, you know, hey, what are your accomplishments? Because Jesus asked the, us to ask that question. Do you know that? Do you love me? As to every human heart, God is asking, do you, you love me? Not because God needs our love, because he knows we need his, and we need to know that we love him. It can't just be in the background, kind of faded, because when it's like that, our lives start deteriorating. Our other relationships start deteriorating. There's no eating. There's no art of hospitality. There's brokenness. There's sin, and there's wounds that are festering, and the elephant is in the room. You know what I'm talking about? And Jesus doesn't ask the question of us, and we don't ask it of our kids. And if we do, shame on us. And Jesus doesn't ask, you know, what were your accomplishments, Peter, while I was gone? What have you done? Or what do you know, the God of the universe, what do you know that can impress me so that we can be connected and I can feel like you're worthy to eat food with me? What, what are you going to do for me? Jesus doesn't ask that question. 
we shouldn't ask that question. That's like the big thing for us. Like, what have you done for me lately? And what have you done at sports? Or, you know, honey, what have you done with this? What have you done with this? What do you really know? And if that's like the underlying major question for us, we are so off. We are lost. And the elephant is getting bigger and we're feeding it because we're ignorant. We don't know. It hasn't been revealed. You can't even see it. The elephant is in the room. Jesus asks, do you love me? And we know he loves us. He died for us. He sacrificed his life on the cross, taking all our sin, our shame, the wounds of our hearts so that we could find healing and hope in him. His answer to our question, God, do you love us? If you're that person, God, do you really love me? I've been going through this. I don't know about that. God, what have you done for me lately? Ba 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 ba. I've got a list. God's unequivocal answer was made real and tangible in the cross and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Amen? We need to know it. We need to believe it. Can a meal change us? Can we connect with Christ? And each other, get the elephant out of the room through a meal. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it starts. You didn't realize meals were so important. They're so fun. They're so tasty. But there's so much more behind them. Last portion I just wanted to point out was this. Jesus says three times, feed my sheep. The second time he says, take care of my sheep. And again he says, feed my sheep. To Peter. He's restoring Peter. So what's that about? What that's saying is, like, what are they doing? They're eating, right? Jesus is feeding Peter. Jesus is feeding the disciples. Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus is all about meeting needs. He has a compassionate heart. And so when Jesus feeds us, and we take our bread, and we take our sustenance, we take our, our energy from him, that enables us to go serve and feed others. That's what Jesus is saying. When he says, care for my sheep, he's saying, as I had compassion on the world and the compassion on the poor and the compassion on the rich and compassion on the, on the, on the religious and the powerful, that I had enough compassion to, to challenge them and to help them. Because when compassion is seeing a need that moves a heart to action, right? Jesus has compassion on his disciples. Jesus is restoring um, Peter. Jesus is restoring his other disciples, saying, we, we were disconnected because you were afraid and no faith, but I've got enough faith for all of us. We're connected. Do you love me? Do you trust me? And there's this, this moment where when we, when we realize that Jesus is compassionate and he cares for people, we realize the depth of care that he has for us and the grace that he's put into our life from there, we can have compassion on others, amen? When we might not, like, really see people or understand or feel what they feel or be motivated to do anything about it, when God, when we realize that God has done that for you and for me, it changes everything. So out of his love, we can love. Out of his sustenance, out of his food, we can feed others. Out of his compassion, we can have compassion. Peter, feed my sheep. He's saying, you can lead as I lead. You can lead better than you can ever imagine, but you have to stay connected. My question for us, friends, are, you, are we being hospitable? Are we feeding the sheep of God? Jesus called all those poor and lonely and in, in need, he called them his sheep. Are we feeding those? Are we connecting with each other? Are we, are we loving our, our kids? Are we loving our families? Are we loving our neighbors, our strangers, people that don't even know the love of God? And if we're not, it might come back to that question, are we being fed from Jesus? Are we getting fed from something else? Is it a TV meal, spiritual dinner? Because again, we've got a world that's obese with disconnection, obese with selfishness, with, our, with their time, and, and it's disconnected, and there are souls that are starving for living water, for eternal food, for real relationship. And I want to challenge us. Are we getting fed? Are we getting our love? Are we receiving God's love into our hearts, into our lives, so that we can serve and we can love others and we, there's enough food to go around for everyone? And that's my challenge for us. Make memorable meals together. This is just a step. 
but just like Jesus did, and let, let's as a church make memorable meals together. Like when people come in to church and we're all leaving, other moments like we meet someone, you're like, hey, maybe let's take them out for coffee. Let's take them out for, for lunch. We've been talking about that for a few weeks. Have we done it? We, we could change the city if we just were super hospitable people because people see Jesus and know Jesus when, when we're eating with them because he's present. He's, he's there. He's using you and me for that. He's a part of the whole deal. Making memorable meals. How about with our families? If, you, if we were honest, you might know someone who doesn't spend time eating with their husband or, or wife or with their kids. They don't spend time together. You might know that person. You might be like kind of looking over. Don't look at them. Just slowly point and I'll know. <laughs> I'm kidding. But seriously, now, um, hospitality starts in the home. It starts with your heart. It starts with those closest. Are you taking time? I would challenge you one, just start with one extra meal a week where you start giving it to your family. And you can answer the question, do you love me with your kids, with your wife? There's 21 meals, give or take, in a week, right? Seven weeks, or seven days in a week. Three meals a day. Let's say there's about 21 meals. In America, it's probably a lot more, but we'll say 21, right? Because we're thin, healthy people, all of us here. 21 meals. Can you tithe a few of those meals to somebody who doesn't know Jesus? Brown bag it at work and spend some time. I don't know, trade some yogurts or something with somebody who doesn't know the Lord. Spend time talking about it. You know, oh, I have yogurt, you know. I don't know. But spend some time or invite someone into your home who's a neighbor who doesn't know Christ that you connect with and you're like, ah, oh, I feel the Lord asking me to spend time with them. We'll just eat together. I'll invite them over for some football, some hot wings. I don't know, hot wings, whatever your specialty is. Spend time together. Can we tithe a few of those 21 meals a week? I mean, that's not that bad, is it? With your kids, same thing. Make sure, hey, I'm going to have a meal. We're going to have a meal all together. That's the challenge. Are you willing to take it? And there's kind of that question, man, hospitality kind of freaks me out. Having people, I'm not a good cook. Uh, our house is a mess half the time. I don't want to clean it. I, get fr I, I don't even know how to start conversation. I got to tell you, food is the conversation. If you, even if, if you don't have enough, I just had a party at my house. And all those questions were, were happening. It was for my community group, and another community group came over. We had two. And I was like, man, are people going to come? My wife's going to kill me because I didn't get quite as far on the cleaning of the house as she wanted me to. And, you know, and, those, and I, you know, I wasn't feeling super great earlier in the week. And I was like, I'm super tired. You know, it'd be easy to cancel something like that. It'd be easy to just be like, nah, nah. People, are people going to come? Is this going to be great? And I'm telling you, like, we had over 70 people at our house. It was crazy and crazy fun. There was a few new people that loved it. There was one guy that was really quiet, though, and she was like, so many people. <laughs> it was crazy. But... I didn't have to bring all the food. We had people bring food, and we had enough. The food stretched. And I didn't have to do all the conversation with 70 people because people, God was there, and people were enjoying it. And, like, there's the art of hospitality. When you invite someone else, like dancing, it, you both start dancing, and you both start eating. You both start talking. And God moves, and people feel loved. And the answer to the question gets answered. Let me just close with this. My favorite meal recently, my favorite moment of the art of hospitality was with my little girl, Novella, and it was a day or two ago, no, a day ago. And I get to have my favorite moments, my favorite meals with her all the time, with my wife all the time. We're trying to get better at it because I can be all over. I'm a pastor. I'm no different than anybody, and I've got like all th sorts of things in my mind. But it was so fun this week. Novella's learning to talk more, and she's having fun. She, we've got a dog named Bosley, and she calls him Bali. That's what she calls him, Bali. And um, we were eating this soup. It was really good soup. And she grabbed the soup, and we're eating there, and me and Sarah are kind of talking. And she looks up, and she goes, Bali. And we're like, good, good girl. And she goes, Bali. And we're, you know, I'm not paying as much attention to her. And then she just picks up her bowl of soup and pours it all over Bosley. <laughs> And he's just like soaked, and he was like, he loves bathing in food. I mean, he was just loving it, licking his fur and just running off. You know, he's like running around in circles too, like licking, and that's kind of gross. I'm sorry I shared that part, but my good, and my, my wife was like, Novella, and Novella's like, ah, and she was so happy. 
<laughs> they just loved it. And I just picked her up and I was like, you fed Bosley. I didn't yell at her. Too bad. No, we just said, like, you fed him. What were you doing? And she's like, Bosley. And she just was loving it. And it was so warm and there was laughter. And, and now it's a story and it's real. And, and she can't even speak full badly in English yet, which isn't even the best English out there. But she knows the answer to that question that she's asking, and she can't even speak. She's loved. I remember my wife took off her clothes, like her little dress thing, it was, had soup all over it. I said, go spray this with the, you know, the, the de-stainer. So I went and sprayed it. And the whole time I'm just laughing. I set it to side, and my little girl comes running in, you know, no clothes except her little diaper, and just, yeah, Bosley. <laughs> it's my favorite meal to date. What's your favorite meal? When was your last one? Who's it going to be with? Whose life are you going to change? Let's pray. Jesus, I love you so much. Lord, help us to kick that elephant out of disconnection. Help us to have great joy with one another. Help us to have great joy in learning the art of hospitality. Lord, thank you that when we ask the question, do you love us? The cross and the resurrection the power of God, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the greatness of, of who you are always says yes. I pray that we'd know it and that we would be able to feed others because of it. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You want to stand with us?